So how to use genomics for structure predictions? So, so we have heard many times the number of sequences is increasing extremely fast, much faster than the number of structures. So how to bridge together this gap, or actually how to use this information. So the whole idea that has been around for a long time and has bloomed since 2009 is that um, today we have put in families and they are covering about 80% of the genomes or, or, the, or the sequences but um, the number is not increasing very fast, or certainly not exponentially, it's kind of a linear increase. And um, that means that there are many more seekers is this representing his family. So by using this information, we can actually get to three-dimensional structure. And the whole thing is, is based on the idea of quantum predictions. So if you know the context of proteins, we can fold it. So this is a contact map here, in this case the green contacts and the blue ones are the ones predicted correctly and the red ones wrong and the grey ones are the real contacts on the other side of the diagonal. So if you have the contact predicted correctly you can make a good model of protein using Rosetta or any other tool or a few other tools. So the whole idea is basically this. You take a multiple sequence alignment, you look at two columns and you see if there are correlations basically for instance that in one of the positions you have a mutation from a big to small amino acids and the one around from a small to a big one. So this is called co-evolution or correlation of mutual information. So this is a method that's been around from the mid-90s. Unfortunately, that didn't really work in a way with quantum predictions. But the idea is that if they are in contact, they are co-evolving. You can see that that. You have a protein. It's well packed nicely. You have a single mutation. That makes this interaction not as nice. And to compensate that, you have a secondary information, mutation. They compensate it. So if you have this, you could imagine you can get all the correlations um, in the protein you get the model contact. However, you see also that it's, this arrow shape has changed on the other side from being a flat pentameter to an arrow. This means that you have indirect effects on the other side there on the green top spot. That, that will result in you will see indirect correlations between the first um, the, the green one and the second random mutations. So you have indirect effects that are not directly showing the relationship between proteins. However, using a global model uh, derived from uh, uh, well, or even from spin models, less models of uh, spin glasses, you can actually detangle, disentangle the indirect and direct effects. And uh, in this way you can say, ah, this is correct. So yes, I show how well this do this works. You can have, you look at what happens when contact maps. So this is a contact map of time for mutual information, and you see you have a few contacts in blue that are correctly predicted, but most of the ones are red or wrong, and basically are no longer edge contacts. But 22% of the contacts are correct. If you use PLMDC a method here instead, or Psycho, you have about half the contacts are correct. So there are two different methods that use this global model, and. Um, you see that long-range contacts that are useful and they are can be used for many other uh, and you can read actually you can actually imagine you predict the structure of this protein using this blue context. However, contacts in proteins are not randomly distributed. And um, you can see this for if you look at the three, even the three by three contact pattern, where you have the most frequent patterns. So if you have a contact in the middle. You can see they are common to have other contacts uh, around it also. Like you have this uh, three corner contacts, you have basically four out of the nine the rest of the covered. However, if you don't have a contact in the middle, you don't want to have any other contacts close to it either. The most common patterns are the ones that are as few contacts as possible. So you look at it, take all the contacts with a given number of, of uh, contacts in this three by three map and look at the frequency of it. If you have not a contact in the middle, you see that 99% are basically having, uh, or 98% have, have no other contacts, and then there are 2% that have one contact, and then another 1% that have two contacts, so that goes down on this dashed line very rapidly. However, if you have contact in the middle, you see still, okay, 10% uh, has uh, no other contacts, but another 10% has one contact, and another 10% has two contacts, etc., etc. So basically it's quite flat until you fill it up, you have nine contacts. So we use this to develop the PCOC2 pipeline. 
which uses the combination of eight alignments and two different se secondary uh, contact prediction methods and smart information. And particularly use the deep learning predicted contact uh, map to do uh, uh, iterative improve the alignment by using this information that the context lies in the other clues, other contacts, particularly in diagonals. So here is what happens. You start with layer one, you see it's not a bad prediction, but not very good. And in layer one, you actually get more contacts that are correct in, in these diagonals. And in three, you do more. And two, you get more. And three, you get more. And four, and five, you get more. And so I end up with 70% correct contacts. So we did this using a deep learning approach using a random forest, a machine learning approach. We basically trained uh, these machine learning things to ha have this. And we used the field of 11 by 11 to look at these contacts. So as we see here, it's better the input methods quite significantly, independently of being the sequence of R. However, we see also here that these methods work very well on big families, but not so well on small families. And, uh, well, that's a good example. But we saw, you can see that other methods like phi CMAP and CMAP Pro are actually much better small families than when they're on big families, than, than these DCA-based methods. So we developed P3, Q, and C3 by including phi CMAP and improve predictions. And do, uh, uh, and uh, improve the prediction qualities. In this way. And you, it was, they make another show that you can use these other methods and do folding, and you can get quite, quite ac very accurate models. They also use something from the Rosetta CM hybridization protocol. And you can end up stretched out two and a half hours to away. 